Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm doing, that's right, another book review. Because, um, I said I would, so I'm doing it, okay? You can't stop me. And here I am doing it for real. Okay? So I got another five books for you, just like the last two videos. If you haven't seen those, uh, feel free to watch them. I, I don't, you mean you don't have to, but they're good, so I would recommend it. Also, I apologize for, um, how... Um, uh, blown out my face is going to be like if I kept my arms up I'd probably be fine but I don't want to do this the whole time I have the raw power of the sun uh, right in front of me so it's just gonna be like this and I apologize and once again we're gonna go a little bit out of order of how I read them and also um, I gotta be honest there are going to be some things that I have forgotten about these books because uh, my life has been fairly stressful uh, lately, so I kind of, my brain don't keep memory as much as good when that's happening. So, you know, just uh, pretend like that's fine. The first book that I read was, hold on, Piranesi by Susanna Clark. And uh, Piranesi is like loosely based in mythology. I think if anything, it's more just like themes and uh, kind of visuals. Um, but really, it's more like let me just say that I loved this book. I rated this 4.75 out of 5 stars. So almost like one of my favorite books like of all time. I didn't quite give it the 5 star rating because like it felt a little uh, confusing and you know sometimes a little bit bland. Um, but I think that it also needed to have that to some extent um, really... I just want to say, also, by the way, I'm not going to have any spoilers, really, unless I say on screen that there will be spoilers, so don't worry about that. For Piranesi, my favorite parts were definitely the world building and the environment. Basically, Piranesi lives in this, like, world that is, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It's just kind of like, it has this power to it, this, this, it's almost a character in its own own sort of way which is kind of like I think it's th the place that Piranesi lives I think I believe is meant to be roughly based on the labyrinth um you know the one with the minotaur and all that it's not really I mean like it's not like you don't see the minotaur right like he's not here but I do believe that it's meant to be based on the labyrinth and so it kind of is its own character in a way. And Piranesi is this character that's really interested in this world that he lives in. And so he basically most of, I think all of what we read is his journal entries essentially on uh, like him categorizing and, and talking about things. And so a lot of that is talking about the place, the labyrinth that he lives in. And so you get to learn a lot about this place and it's truly fascinating. And I fucking love the, just the environment period. I love the, I love the labyrinth in general. Um, there's so many like really interesting uh, things that happen here. Most of the time it's just like talking about these massive statues that are here and the ways that like certain areas kind of more desolate and uh, full of nature and um, some are more like pristine and like this is this is like a marble hallway with statues lining the hall. Um, but it, it's it's definitely my favorite part of this book. I I truly fell in love with it at that. There's a train, I don't know if you can hear that. Part of why it's a little uh, challenging to pick up and maybe a little confusing is because this is his journal entries. So what makes it a little bit challenging is the fact that in the beginning of the book, it's a journal that references a lot of material that you, the reader, have not seen or heard or, like, have had described to you at this point. So you're kind of like, oh, what is that? Oh, I don't know what this is. I don't know how Piranesi's categorization, like, system works. So you're kind of learning, um, but you're also just confused. Um, but I think that this helps make the book interesting as it progresses because then you start to be like, oh, 
this is that thing that was mentioned earlier that I didn't understand then, but now I kind of do. So that's where I really kind of found the intrigue uh, very fun. And Piranesi is basically alone in this labyrinth. Um, he's basically just here by himself. Uh, we eventually learn that that isn't true, uh, that there's another person that he calls the other because... I don't think a, a name was officially given to him, given to Piranesi from the other. Uh, so the other is here, uh, but they only meet like every once in a while. And um, like they have a designated meeting time or something. And so you kind of get to feel Piranesi's like isolation, though he doesn't necessarily feel it as isolating. Um, he, he like... He has this like childhood naivety to him where this labyrinth is a place that comforts him. That is a character that like gives him life as well. Like interaction, like these statues that he sees, like he has characterized them all, named them all. Um, and so he basically has a relationship with the labyrinth itself. And so he doesn't feel alone, but he is he is alone in terms of like other human beings around every once in a while he gets to meet with and talk to the other um but the other doesn't really you know is a little bit apathetic doesn't necessarily uh want to be too involved with piranesi so uh we get this and then eventually like we get you know a climax going and we get uh conflict and all sorts of things building up as this book goes, um, which I will not go into uh, very much because I don't want to spoil anything about this. Um, I think that you probably could figure uh, figure it out, but it's going to take you a little bit of time, I believe, to figure out kind of where it's going, what the mystery uh, truly is, um, because you aren't given a lot of information in the start. Truly, I love Piranesi as... Uh, protagonist as a like main character I said it before but his like childhood naivety is really what makes him a unique and interesting character because he has this sort of purity uh, that you don't tend to see very often in like media and in like other books um, so it was very refreshing to kind of get that like childhood pureness in this character even though I, I he's not a child <laughs> um he just kind of is like this like he uh takes care of the labyrinth and uh will like set offerings for things and uh it's very very it's just like a compelling character trait of his that i i really love because he cares so deeply about this place and the things within it um and also other living beings uh, not just the other, but there are animals and stuff as well. And so it's almost like he gets to, we get to see like him mythologic, mythologic, myth, mythologicize, what? I don't know how to say that. Uh, make myths of this other, of these other things that are happening around him. And then the last thing I'll say is that the ending evokes a feeling of hollowness that is very much intentional and um, I very much loved. I, uh, there were, I think there were some people that probably wouldn't enjoy the ending so much, but I really, really enjoyed the ending. Um, I think that the entire book kind of works up to this uh, and is a part of it as well, but I think that the ending is what helps kind of solidify the fact that one of the main themes seems to be like this sense of childhood versus adulthood and like where Piranesi in the beginning very much represents like a child he is kind of a representation of childhood and then as certain things start to happen and things reveal themselves uh you kind of get to see like that that fight between childhood and adulthood thematically emerge and I found it really interesting so let's construct uh uh like a, a, a big statue of the next book oh the next book that I read was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. You know, like, the Frankenstein? Yeah, that's that's the one I read. Recently, I've been wanting to do more kind of, like, classic literature, and uh, horror is something that has always interests me, and so 
I wanted to read Frankenstein because I knew that I would enjoy it, which is weird to say because like I, you know, I don't know a lot about it, uh, not the original work anyway. And so, but I knew that I would enjoy it because just basically just based on what it is and the, what it deals with. I believe I rated Frankenstein 3.75 stars out of five. And that's to me, that's still a good rating. Okay. Like three stars out of five is still above average. So I still like it, but I want to say that I didn't rate it as highly because it is an older piece of literature and I don't always enjoy reading older literature. Um, it's not, it's not that bad in this, in this book. Um, it's pretty like reasonable. Um, but you know, it's, 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 it has its isms of the time, but overall it's pretty good. I think what I liked most about Frankenstein was probably its themes of isolation. I don't know if this is in like all versions of Frankenstein, because apparently there are two versions. I don't actually know which one I read, but the book opens with not Frankenstein's account, not anything to do with Frankenstein. It's this other guy, some captain, I forget his name. Um, and it, so it starts with him but we get to see the isolation of him, the captain, Frankenstein, uh, Victor Frankenstein, and the monster that Frankenstein creates. So uh, this theming of isolation is very fun and very like prominent throughout. And you get to kind of see the ways that isolation um, influence people in different ways. This is not like a horror book in that like it's scary. This is uh this is um i forget what term they they used to call it i'll put it up on screen or something but this is like a psychological type of horror right um the horror comes from the fact that frankenstein dreads what he has created in the monster he's like so invested into it he loves uh like he is he's really searching for this this uh way to make life and once he does it he immediately is horrified by what he's done frankenstein gets to experience the horror of what he has created and then what that creation does to the things that he loves um so that is the horror aspect of this book uh, it's it's definitely more in like that realm um but i still found it very interesting and compelling i find this book very interesting because um i'm sure there are frankenstein empathizers out there and like i kind of am to some extent but really if you're not empathizing for the monster itself i don't know if you read this book <laughs> which is i'm red alert you can read a book any way you want and you can understand it any way you want i'm just making a joke okay um, I just think that the monster is very empathizable uh, and it's just like this monster's own creator said, nah, fuck you, you're terrifying and disgusting and I never want to see you again. Has, so the monster is forced to learn fucking human language and everything else in between by itself by himself and uh so yeah it's um it's uh, no, just a little bit it's a little bit uh you know not good for him and so while like yeah the monster kills people and you're like morally that's not good <laughs> you're like okay but like i can understand why you're killing people a little bit you know like i can understand where you're coming from um and like you can't help but blame victor frankenstein for it just as much as the monster because if he had put any work into caring for this monster that he created none of this would have happened and that is to say like also i i did find frankenstein as a character interesting um i found the captain as a character interesting um but ultimately i found the monster the most interesting character in the book uh, I just think he has a lot of depth that is interesting to play and uh, like I would want to watch and play out and see the way that he learns what it's like to live in this place filled with humans that are all scared and terrified of him because of the way that he looks. Um, so I don't know. I just I find Frankenstein the most interesting character. But I also think it's interesting uh, how this book kind of deals with love and beauty um because there are certainly like some queer themes in this book pretty much every person 
especially the captain and Frankenstein himself, um, talk about other people as being beautiful. Like Frankenstein, before he's disgusted by his creation, is like enamored by the monster. Um, and also like he has this best friend and he's like, my best friend, this guy, he's so beautiful. God, I would marry him if I could. But instead, I have to marry my kind of sister cousin woman lady. Yeah, I'd, I'd say Frankenstein is a is an enjoyable read. If you're interested in like old horror and some of the origins behind it, I definitely recommend it. Um, and if you're interested in those themes of like morality and isolation and just stuff like that, I recommend it. If like the language if like the old type of language is going to like be like a point of contention for you, understandable, but I will say, I don't think it's that bad in this book. So if that is like your main concern, maybe give it a shot. Cause I don't actually think it's that bad. And so now we're going to construct the perfect being that is the next book. And by perfect being, I, I didn't mean like it's a perfect book. I just meant I really liked it. And that is bite for bite. Uh, do I, mm. Bite for Bite, Nourishments and Jamborees uh, by Amy Last Name. I do not know how to pronounce her last name, so I'm not going to try because uh, it will not be good. I really enjoyed this author, actually. Uh, I, I first got into her uh, when I read her World of Wonders book, um, which I thoroughly enjoyed, like beautiful book and that I would recommend to anyone so I quickly became a fan of her and uh she's kind of more known for poetry and honestly I'm not a big fan of poetry if I spent the time to get to learn it a little bit more I would probably enjoy it um but I haven't done that so I don't really enjoy poetry that much however I do like poetic language and that's exactly what Amy does in these books and that it's very beautiful. There's a, there's a poem uh, here and there, but like, they're not <laughs> that hard to understand. Um, so I appreciate that. And so I, I didn't enjoy this one as much. World of Wonders is very much about like the creatures, uh, plants, animals, insects of nature. And this one is more about food, uh, which can sometimes be like kind of vaguely be plants in terms of like fruit and stuff in nature as well. But I did thoroughly enjoy this one. And I think the reason why I liked this one not as much is because you kind of get these two different types of uh, chapters. Each chapter will be on its own food or uh, fruit or whatever. And some chapters will basically be like, here's me recounting like these memories I have uh, that I'm thankful for be and uh, this fruit or this food is centered around that memory. Those chapters I love. The other chapters are kind of just looking at that food itself and like the history behind it or um, kind of the way that it's traditionally prepared or seen or viewed or the cultures that it's used in. And I do find that interesting. I just, I prefer the type of kind of more like memoir-ish type of uh, of literature uh, in terms of nonfiction. And so I prefer the ones that are a little bit more personal. Um, so that's why I like those chapters more. I like all of them, but I do like those chapters more. I honestly, I don't think I have that much to say about this book because th there's not like really one like cohesive plot throughout because it's chapter based. Um, but I will say that it's the, the stories are absolutely lovely and I truly enjoy reading them every single time. A lot of it has to do with Amy's own family and her children who, uh, we get to see kind of grow up in a little bit, uh, a bit of a way and her husband and, uh, just just like her family like heritage uh because she is not white 
<laughs> so we get to see, you know, some of the ways that like culture and all these different things impacted her and her childhood and her children's childhood. Uh, so I get to, I really enjoy reading these stories. It's just beautiful. And I think that if there's one thing that Amy is good at, it's at making you like, it's making you remember that you should value these things, even if they're small, even if it's just like a small piece of food item that you have, like maybe once a year, it's like to remember that and think about why it's special and all the work that was put into it, the memories that it can evoke. And, uh, yeah, so very much enjoyed this read. Uh, and I think it's time to finally move on from food to Food to Fighting Gaia, I guess. That's the best I could come up with. We're finally on to it. The fourth book in the Heroes of Olympus series, and that is The House of Hades. Uh, I believe it was either this one or the third book that is my favorite in the series. I truly loved House of Hades, and I don't think... Many people will disagree with me on that. Uh, I think a lot of people would say House of Hades is in at least top two of the series. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think that's probably going to be fairly agreed upon. And I think a large reason for that is because we get a, a large amount of Percy and Annabeth chapters where they are together. <laughs> like they're not split up. They work together. They help each other. Uh, and that's, I mean, like, you know, that's just a, a big part of it. And also this is a, a really good book in that, like you have a lot of different perspective chapters, which doesn't always happen in these. I appreciate having more perspectives than just three or four. I just want more variety. Uh, also some of the characters I get to them are like, mm, I don't know if I care that much about you. It's like, yeah, we're on book five, book four. Um, but I, I, I don't, I, you, I can see where the effort was put in to develop you, but I don't, I just feel like it, it, it wasn't, we didn't get enough of what was needed to make you as great as you could be. Percy and Annabeth are in Tartarus and I really love these, this section of the book because I just think being in Tartarus is very cool and traumatizing for the both of them. And there's one thing you should know about me it's that i like when my characters have trauma <laughs> which is fucked up yes but yeah i like i like how much they get to rely on each other and you get to see like truly how deep their bond is and their relationship is which is something that you don't always get and i'm really glad that we get to see that because percy and annabeth deserve to have that like bond and relationship put on the page because it is truly great um, so I really enjoy the Tartarus, Percy and Annabeth chapters. There's some really cool stuff that happens in there. Really cool visuals. Um, Bob shows up. I'm also like not going to mention anything about it because I don't want to spoil it. But Nyx and Alkiel's, Alkies, I'll put it on screen. I don't know how you pronounce it. Two very cool characters that show up and I very much enjoy uh, witnessing what happens with them and how the demigods deal with them. So that's all I'll say. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, Nico comes out as... Well, Nico is revealed to be gay in this uh, book. Which is... What I've been waiting for. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I don't know what happened there. Uh, so I have been wishing and dreaming upon a star for a <laughs> queer character in this series and Nico is the one that I kind of knew was coming and I'm very happy that it did finally um I, I will admit it was definitely uh traumatic for Nico which um I don't always appreciate now I, I did just say that I like when my characters have trauma however the 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 trope that gay people have to be traumatized by their coming out is a little bit overdone and I don't always appreciate it. But I do understand why a fucking like 13 or 14 year old boy from who was originally from like fucking 
not ancient, but ancient Italy, uh, would have a little bit of difficulty with this one. Um, and also I like that, uh, Nico has to face off against Eros and, uh, that's kind of fun. And I like that Jason is there to, um, kind of help him through it. I don't know if he does a great job, but he at least shows that he is there to support Nico. And I appreciate that. I also think that it's cool that, uh, Hazel is kind of given, um, a sort of, uh, big task in this book. Hecate shows up and is like, Hazel, just so you know, you're going to have to do some really big stuff here and uh, we're all counting on you and you really have to do it. And Hazel's like, I don't know how to do any of that stuff you're asking me to do. And uh, Hecate's just like, well, do it anyway. So I like Hazel's uh, journey in this. I think she's she's pretty cool and I like Hazel. So I enjoyed getting that. I also like that Piper kind of learns to be more confident in this book. Um, Piper seems to have always been like the quote unquote weakest uh, member of the seven. And uh, I'm glad that we kind of get to see that. Yeah. Piper's not weak. She's very strong and uh, she gets to learn that about herself too. So I'm glad we get that. Uh, and lastly, Calypso's back. Leo and Calypso. I like their interactions. Uh, I don't have any problems with it really. It's just, it kind of came a little bit out of nowhere. Um, it kind of just felt like they were like, well, everyone here is paired up romantically except for Leo. So let's give Leo Calypso, I guess. But anyway, I really, uh, I truly enjoyed this book. Uh, probably, uh, probably my favorite in the series. So I'll take it. Now let's conjure up the mist so that we can dive deeper into the fifth book. All right, everybody, it's Blood of Olympus time. That's right, it's the final book in the Heroes of Olympus series. And this one, kind of anticlimactic. Not my favorite in the series. I was really hoping for a cool, awesome uh, showdown. And uh, that didn't fully happen. First of all, the main thing about this book that I loved, Reyna and Nico chapters. Need I say more? Okay, I'll say more. I really like that we get Reyna's backstory. I like that we get to see some of her character and why she is the way that she is and uh, some of the stuff that she has to deal with. I also really like that Nico has so much weight on his shoulders and aside from the other stuff, aside from being gay, and has to do a lot. Their task is um, honestly greater than the other, than the seven. So... <laughs> Go, Nico and Reyna. I really like their characters. I love them a lot. And uh, Nico literally is pushing himself very closely to death. And I like that we get to see Nico and his dad, Hades, uh, interact with each other. So I really appreciated that. And uh, I like that we got to see Reyna and her sister have a little bit of talk. And uh, yeah, just in, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed all of that aspect of this book. Also, I can't wait for more Nico and Will. Uh, I think what they did, their setup with Apollo is interesting. And uh, I am going to be reading uh, Trials of Apollo series. I think it'll be interesting. I like Nico and Will and I want to read Sun and Star, but I have to get through Trials of Apollo first. So I will. So the original three, and by that I mean not Percy and Abeth Grover. I mean the original three of this series uh jason piper and leo they are the most important in this book but i'm gonna be honest with you i don't know how much it matters and if it really feels like they're the most important in this book i honestly feel like reyna and nico were the most important mostly because the final battle was very anticlimactic and i will have a spoiler talk for that in a moment but i just want to say I get why you're going to bring it back to having these three be the ones that ended because they're the ones that started it. However, I wanted to see the others do more. And like, it doesn't have to be a whole lot, but Frank, Percy, Annabeth, and Hazel did almost fucking nothing in this book. And I really am not happy about that. I'll also say I liked the happy endings for, for, for what that's worth. Um, and I'm looking at my notes and, uh, 
the really the only part from this book that I m- remember is the fact that they actually I remember two parts. They have to go to find Apollo's son, the god of medicine, and I thought that was fun. And I liked uh, when Annabeth and Piper had to go to the fucking pit, fire pit thing place that they're at. Um, I kind of liked that uh, Piper got to kind of show her strengths and Annabeth uh while I didn't, I didn't truly love how Annabeth was handled in it. I do think that I liked that she kind of had to give up control a little bit, and that um, Piper got kind of, kind of got to teach Annabeth something. Um, so I, I found that interesting. I also, I also think it's interesting that uh, Jason makes a big promise, like Percy did uh, in the original series. I like that Jason is like, "Hey, I'm gonna promise to like." help all these minor gods and, and goddesses and stuff uh, be more recognized because they deserve it. And I don't know, I think it's an interesting concept. I still just find Jason kind of bland. Uh, I like Piper a little bit. I like Leo a decent amount. Uh, I like Hazel, Frank, and uh, Percy and Annabeth the most. Now for spoilers, okay? If you don't want spoilers, uh, honestly, you can end the video because this is basically the end of it. So... Here we go. Uh, The Gaia fight lasts like three minutes. What the fuck is that? Why? Can we get something interesting? Literally, okay. Jason has to blow Gaia up in the sky, keep her afloat. Piper talks to Gaia, makes her kind of sleepy. And then Leo comes out of nowhere, blows up Gaia. Hooray, we won. This took place over like maybe 10 pages. How are you going to build up Gaia this much? And that's all we fucking get? Like 10 pages? And ultimately, it's like nothing. Ultimately, Gaia is extremely beatable. Easy even to beat. And it's just kind of like, whatever, man. I... I was not happy with how they did did that. Meanwhile, Percy and the others are doing nothing. Uh, I mean, they're not doing nothing. They're helping out with the battle between the Romans and uh, uh, the... Well, at at this point, it's not Romans v. Greeks. It's actually Romans and Greeks versus uh, all the monsters and stuff. But, like, we don't see any of it, so it does it really matter? Not really. So, yeah, very anticlimactic. I didn't like the ending. Uh, The thing that I liked most about it was the fact that Octavian blew the fuck up, and I thought that was hilarious. Is there anything else? Is there anything else? And I guess uh, Leo lives, and uh, he is able to free Calypso. So that's cool. So yeah, not. uh, I think I rated Blood of Olympus 4 out of 5 stars. Honestly, it's purely because of the Nico and Reyna chapters. Um, I don't know if I gave the rating for... House of Hades, but I gave it 4.5 out of 5. And uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for, thanks for for checking out this book review. I am going to be reading The Trials of Apollo, so be prepared for me to review some of those books coming up. And as for the rest, I don't really know. So uh, we'll just have to find out when we get there. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, like it. If you want to see more, please subscribe. It really helps me out, makes me feel good inside. And I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.